Wave to the people, Kirk. <laughs> In this corner, we have Martha Manicus Foster. Go, Martha. <laughs> Last but not least, go, Amanda. We have Hello, Amanda. Amanda. Hello, Martha. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, everybody, to the Quarantine Cup Throwdown. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. I can't hear you. Uh oh. We can hear you. We can hear you, Martha. <laughs> yes, can you we not? can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today's challenge, um, the quarantine cup throwdown. We're going to have three, the three three of our uh, ceramics instructors creating a chalice today. Um, yeah. uh, using multiple techniques. Um, it only, it makes Mitchell kind of concerned because there's a cord across my face. <laughs> I don't care. Um, I'm going to go to Amanda, who can talk a little bit more about today's challenge. <laughs> Thanks, Mitchell. <laughs> um, so this whole thing kind of came about after um, we all went into isolation and some of the ceramics students and I were texting back and forth. Um, and Alan and Jeff, who are some of our dedicated ceramic students, just said, hey, we should challenge each other to make goblets. And they each have clay at home. Um, Jeff doesn't have a wheel, Alan does. So we, we figured we'll leave it pretty broad and open. Our only limit is be less than 20, 20 pounds. <laughs> so given that I am somewhat conservative with my clay right now, because I'm working from my home basement studio as it is now, um, under 20 pounds is something that I could adhere to pretty easily. <laughs> Thank you, love. Um, so so it kind of grew and evolved into this bigger thing. And I thought it would be entertaining for everybody who's at home to see all of 171's instructors kind of entertaining you all for a Friday afternoon to see what the wheel looks like and how we each do it a little bit differently. Okay, great. Um, Looks like Martha might be having some technical difficulties. Um, Martha, you might want to leave and come back. Um, and while she's doing that, let's go to Kirk. <laughs> There's Kirk Hello, on his uh, Am I introducing myself? Hello, I'm Kirk Allen. <laughs> <laughs> so Hello. you have a different clay than the Kirk other. Allen. I'm here, do you wonder how much clay we're going to use for each one, or are we on just we'll let we'll answer that question later? Uh, you can answer that now, or what I'm clay going are to you start using? Start out actually? with four pounds of clay to make the bowl shape. I'm not sure how much clay it's going to take to make the pedestal, so because I haven't made any pedestals yet. All so right. that's what I'm going to do. And you're using a different if you have clay. Any questions? Then? Please feel free to type in and ask. We will do our best and. This could be interesting. Failure is always an option. Failure. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. Thank you, Barb Taylor Ross. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want? Uh, Hi, Barb. Martha's texting us. I'm going to tell her to step off and step back off. Yeah. But. So I'm going to try putting together one that I made last night. I'm going to do some measurements. So I'm using the Lidmaster calipers. Hello, Barb. Glad to see you. <laughs> we hope it's not going to be too much rumbling because rumbling usually means clay falls, but we'll have a good time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to try using my foam bat because this is a little bit dry. Well, I'm going to throw a 
a chalice section to start out with, so at least I throw one. I've got a few already prepped. Yes, we do have to do kind of the, the Food Network work ahead options so that you guys can see the whole process. I think we're all going for the two-part assembly chalice today. I tried doing a um, one single throne piece last night. That that didn't go well. <laughs> I have tried those in the past. I have never been very good at closing them off. So I have done the um, single part throne chalice where mm -hmm. the pedestal itself holds liquid too. Yeah. Which isn't really a chalice, I don't think. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a bottomless wine glass. That's all that is. <laughs> So Kirk, do you throw and trim with a mirror? I do throw and trim with a mirror, yes. Which is, it's got its mixed um, bag because right now my mirror is the bottom half where I actually see in, look through is covered with splatters of clay. <laughs> That's not very helpful. <laughs> it's not, but I can still see about some of it, yeah. <laughs> hey Amanda, can you, are you working on your wheel now? Oh, yeah. You actually want to see what I'm doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pull you down. So we're just waiting for uh, Martha to join back with us. She's having a little bit of technical difficulties, which we knew could be a, a, pr a problem going in. But it's all live. It's all fun. We're just here to have a good time and hopefully give you a little bit of relief from everything that's happening in the world yeah. right now. <laughs> So. so there's this magic trick in clay that I have not mastered and I'm practicing with called tap centering. When you're trimming a piece rather than scribing a line and pushing and adjusting and going back and forth like 10 times, you're just supposed to be able to touch your pot and just lightly tap it and it goes into the middle, which... I'm pretty close. I'm just seeing how smoothly this is spinning. I'm gonna double check with my pin tool. And what I'm looking for is a circle on the bottom of this, which I'm gonna pick up and screw up so you can see, but see how I drew a circle on there. So I want that to be equal all the way around. It's not, <laughs> which means I have to move it around. But of course, now that I've picked it up, I have to start over. But that's okay. I wanted you guys to see what it looked like. And Amanda, I'm going to tap center later on when I put my top when I put my pre-made tops back onto the wheel. To yeah. Well, so. somebody will get to see the magic trick then. Yeah. So we had somebody, and I'm not sure what they're seeing. Um, they asked, uh, can you explain oh, why it, you use a mirror? Oh, that's what we were talking about while you were um, off screen helping Martha. The mirror, I'll answer first and then Kirk, I'll let you take it. Um, it allows for us to see the, sh the profile, the edge of the piece that you're working on. So you don't have to like go sideways and, you know, <laughs> look to see this the part that you're working on because we're much higher than the wheel it's hard to see straight on so when you use a mirror it just allows you to look straight ahead without having to bend over and change your perspective with your body yeah what it does it's just nice because if you're going to throw a lot of pieces one right after another and you're gonna sit here a while. If you're throwing a piece, I know I've seen people throw bowls every two minutes, they're doing another bowl, they're that fast. And if you have to do this every two minutes, you eventually get your back and your torso gets very tired. So with a mirror, we can keep mm -hmm. our torso and our mass centered over top of our spinal cord and we don't get nearly as tired and we don't um, do nearly as much damage to our back. Yeah. Pottery so, is known for back problems. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not. Mm -hmm. We try to be conscious of our bodies mm -hmm. because okay. 
I don't know about you, but my body tells me when I've done something that it does not like. <laughs> and if you if you pay attention, I think my wheel is actually set higher than Amanda's in. Um, my my wheel's pretty high. My wheel head yeah. is almost the height of my navel. And a lot of times, people are they're sitting on a stool that's the height of their wheel head, not their. So I'm pretty I'm pretty up high with my wheel head. Because my yeah. back can't handle the. And mine's a little bit more awkward because this is all a single piece. Maybe later on I'll kind of move my camera around so you guys can see this wheel setup. This is a Randall wheel. So I have this big bowl. That's my splash pan. And I have the wheel head. But I'm attached to the wheel by sitting on an iconic orange tractor seat, which can move up and down. And it can slide forward a little bit. Um, but as far as heightening this throwing surface, that's stationary. That's where it is forever. When you're at a more typical electric wheel, you could put that up on cinder blocks or the, the usual option. And then you end up raising that so that it could be belly button height or a little bit higher. And it ends up being more ergonomic. I have friends who actually stand at their wheel mm -hmm. and set their wheel at um, navel height, their wheel head at the height of your navel so that you can, so that there's not this um, bending over because once again, if you spend all day at it, it's, it's hard on your it's hard on your back. It's hard on your everything. Um, there's a artist that I like. Her name's Kristen Kiefer. Um, I have one of her cups upstairs. She's a throwing, standing thrower. Mm -hmm. And she has her set up so that she has like this um, wooden backboard attached to her wall. So she oh. kind of braces herself against the wall in between that and her wheel, and it takes the pressure off of her legs and her back, so she can do some long-term standing. So does she lean against it or the whole time, or is it just so when she centers, she can push it back against it? Um, you know, I haven't actually seen a video of her doing it. I've only seen still photographs of it, so I'm not sure. I would think that she's kind of leaning backwards because it's it's bowed outwards to kind of be against the curb of the back mm -hmm. um so i think she's kind of just like wedged in between the wheel and the wall backer but it looks like a pretty sweet setup i'd like one I'd have to turn my wheel around because right now, right there, just like six inches longer than my arm is a cinder block. It's not. A, it's a concrete wall. Yeah. So now before we <laughs> before we had to go home, um, we had just gotten a new wheel in the studio. Our uh, accessible wheel which mm -hmm. is designed for those in wheelchairs. But when it's not being used like that, we can use it as a standing wheel because the wheel head adjusts from low to high. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be a nice option for students that are having some back issues and yes. don't want to hunch over their wheel when we get back into the studio. Mm -hmm. And I don't so, know if you guys can, oh, hi, Mitchell. Hi, both of you, we're, we're still waiting for Martha to rejoin us. Unfortunately, she is having technical difficulties. <laughs> um, but um, both of you do have some classes that are getting ready to be added to our online um, catalog. Do you, either of you want to talk about what you guys have coming up? Yeah, Kirk, you go first. All right. Um, I am going to start on Monday doing 
a, a wheel a wheel throwing survey. So what we're going to do is we're going to be um, throwing different basically functional wear on the potter's wheel. Oops, that wasn't a good thing to do. I have clay on my face. Um, throw a <laughs> the um, on the potter's wheel, and we're going to start out on Monday doing cylinders and moving the because that's the most basic form most if you if you watch us all throw we typically throw a cylinder first and then shape from there um and so i'm going to start with cylinders and then we're going to create those cylinders into mugs and what i call tumblers because and the difference between a mug and a tumbler is a tumbler doesn't have a handle a mug does <laughs> and then so we'll do that and we'll in the magic of television, we're gonna we'll try taking it through the whole thing. So we'll start throwing the, the mugs and the tumblers. I'll have a few that are leather hard with some handles, and I'm gonna attach the handles onto the mugs at the time, trim and attach the handles. So we're gonna see that, and then we'll keep doing that for different classes. So the next class we're gonna do bowls. The to see bowls be done on the wheel from a cylinder out, and we'll trim some bowls on that day too. And I think I might have more than I can pack it in the shower, but we'll just keep moving and get as much done as we can. And we'll do plates along in that line vein. We're going to do um, vases and bottles. And then finally, we're going to try getting some, some working with some lids on pieces. So mm. we're Sounds going to, fun. We're, the, we're going to try running the gamut. So can anybody sign up for your class, Kirk? Do they have to have experience? Well, because we're watching, <laughs> you don't have to have experience. And so anybody can sign up. Um, we had a discussion on what age we're willing to accept to sign up. And as far as I'm concerned, anybody can sign up for the class because anybody can watch and learn. Um, then eventually as part of this program, we're talking about if you've signed up for the, the class or multiple classes like Martha's and um, Amanda's also, that when 171 opens, we'll set a timeout and people will be able to come in and choose a, um, a project and do that, spend some time in the studio on for a session making that project. So it's there that's going to make it a little bit different on what's going to happen because we typically don't put real young kids on the wheel without parental supervision mm -hmm. so a parent will have to be there but um if you have questions those really minutia details will be much better answered probably at 171 with a phone call than trying to go through all the examples here that would take place or people can email me Okay. Warren, Warren A at 171 Cedar Art Center dot org. And okay. we can try and answer any questions because you're right, Kirk, it's going to be different than what we've done before. Um, it's definitely a process over product. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the major differences. You know, typically people sign up for classes and they're making stuff every class. Yep. This one's going to be a bit more like watch, learn, and then try eventually. Yep. Thanks, Mitchell. There's my email address at the bottom of my uh, square and screen there. Um, so we'll have a little bit of time to get the logistics figured out of getting people to 171 to pick up these at home kits potentially. They, you can take them home and work on them and then bring them back to get fired and finished at 171. Because it, it's going to probably be a little while before we're back up and running in the same capacity that we typically are. So we have to do things a little bit more creatively and adapt to the situation, I think. Mm -hmm. One thing that is going to be interesting is because we're doing these on zoom calls we're going to be inter you'll be able to interact with us verbally at the same time unlike now where you know we're we're interacting with amanda and martha and i but 
the people who are watching can't see. So these classes are going to be much more interactive. So as things are happening, you can say, um, "Can go, go back a minute. You, what did you just do? <laughs> you know? Right. Well, like, we'll give you one that, that I find interesting that I do is when you watch Amanda and Martha, I, I know Amanda does. When we get done, we want to finish the rims off of our pots. And Amanda will use a chamois. I think I, think I have a chamois here somewhere. Yes, I do. Amanda uses a chamois, and and I, I've used it a lot. It's wearing out. But recently, what I've started using is a, it's kind of hard to see because it's covered with all kinds of clay. I've actually started using a, a thick piece of plastic to smooth mm. my rims. I did that when I was in college because <laughs> I didn't have access to a chamois. chamois. <laughs> <laughs> so I just used um, part of my clay bag or even yes. like really thin garbage bag and just pulled that apart. And that was really great mm -hmm. for even burnishing too. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but that's kind of the, the nice thing about having three instructors is because we all do it a little different. And I've told people there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do it. There are, sometimes there's more efficient ways versus other ways. Um, but I've seen a lot of different ways of doing pottery. And I've seen a lot of successful potters do pottery in some pretty strange ways. Yeah. Well, that's what my one, that's what the throne cup's gonna look like, top of the cup's gonna look like. That's pretty healthy, Kirk. <laughs> It'll hold ice cream. So you are using a different clay than Martha and I are. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. This clay is a clay that 171 used to have. It's a dark brown clay, and it's got a problem where the clay itself will, in the firing, blisters and loses its structure. Mm, 266. And, yeah. So Our what I have done. This. Yes. What I have done is I have some Raku clay. I believe it's it's either 339 or 250, depending on what company you get it from, something like that. Um, I have some Raku clay, and I've mixed this dark brown clay that has a blistering problem with my Raku clay to hopefully maintain close to the right color, but to give it more um, structure in the firing process. And since I've fired, I have fired this Raku clay up to tone 10 in the wood kiln at Corning Community College. I think it's going to give me more structure in the process. Now, I have not fired it yet in this mix. So <laughs> all this stuff I'm making could blister. Who knows? Sure. But that's one of the, the joys of doing pottery and ceramics is sometimes you experiment. And since currently the 171 kiln is not being fired because we're not there, I've made a lot of stuff in this clay, <laughs> so I can be really sad when the time comes. Well, you know, that's one thing that I have to always keep in the forefront of my mind. Uh, ceramics knows how to humble you. <laughs> yes. Always. Okay. Um, there was a discussion about tap centering. Yes, the magic trick. The magic trick. So what I'm about to do is I'm about to tap center. So your wheel is spinning slowly. Um, my wheel is spinning slowly, and I'm guiding the pot with my left hand. Okay. And sort of letting it go there and keeping it from flying around. So this is where my control of my pot, my pot is. And then what's happening is, so I can feel whether or not the pot is centered with my left hand. And then with my right hand, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tap it. And as I tap it, I'm going to keep catching it in my left hand until my left hand feels like it's touching the pot evenly all the way around. So like if it's off a little bit, look at it, we'll start again. So you can see that it's, it's gonna wobble. Yep. And I can get pretty close to center by actually looking at the scratch lines on my, my bat from throwing so long. So I can get close, but to make, to get it finally, I'm very, pretty close. I'm just going to gently tap it. And the, getting it to move 
And then I can just tap it in. And then as Amanda did, just so you can sort of see what's going on, I'm going to draw a circle in the top. I don't know if you can see, you're going to be able to see this or not. No, I don't, I don't think we can see it. Well, I could um, drive um, Mitchell Bonkers and do this. <laughs> Okay. There we go. Yes. Can you see that line in the top that I drew? Yeah. Nice. And the advantage of why what I have in my phone is because it's magnetized, the mount is still the same. I get uh, another magic trick. Yes, another magic trick. <laughs> I freaked you guys out Verizon when I came in to swap my phone out because my old phone had it too. And when I stuck my phone to their ceiling on the the framing around the false ceiling tiles, they thought I was crazy when I let go. And then when it didn't fall, they're like, oh, that's it. But yeah. So do you think you go more by touch than by sight when you're tap centering? Yes, it's all by touch. I okay. can tap center because it's, it's all what my left hand is telling me. You can close your eyes and it's just, okay. Yeah, so this is, it's, it's literally just feeling it. You can do it, you know, people who do it, we're not doing it by sight at all. Mm, excellent. Um, so I'm going to use one of my favorite ceramic tools, a spoon. I'm going to try, try and burnish uh, this bowl because this is actually the bowl that I threw on Wednesday for our live stream demo for how to make a bowl on the wheel. And it got a little bit dry on me. So I've been shattering with my tool, which is, um, I'll hold it up in a couple minutes. It's when your tool kind of bumps around on your clay and it creates a cool pattern, but I would actually like it to be smooth. So I'm going to use the spoon as this spins to just kind of polish the clay and hopefully erase some of the grog marks that are on here. So just some gentle yet firm pressure. And you might see the difference in the camera. I'm not sure if, it, if it'll pick it up, but it's gonna start to get a little bit more shiny just because I'm polishing the surface and burnishing, which is another word for polishing. Um, it just kind of laminates and pushes all of the gritty stuff back down into the matrix of the clay. And what I do is I actually have a smooth stone, a polished stone that I use. Oh, nice. How long have you had it? Uh, try and think. 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a spoon that I have been long-term borrowing from my alma mater. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that on permanent loan? It is. Um, <laughs> so if I, if I go back, um, I will return it to them. I think it has a nice patina on it now. It's better than when I found it. Well, the, I was introduced to the smooth stone when I was in high school by watching a video on a woman out in Arizona mm -hmm. that fires black clay, black clay. Um, and so she burnishes all her pots because they pit fire them and the burnishing makes them shiny. And that's is she Native person. American? She is Native American. It's mm, yeah. Anna Marie... I love her Couture's? stuff. Couture's? yeah. Maybe. Mm. You can find her video online. It's from like the 1960s. So it's... There's Maria it's, Martinez too. Yeah. Mm. This is, um, her son is um, Hobie Day. Ew. Cool, cool. And so she had a, a smooth river rock. And I'm like, oh gosh, I'd love to have a smooth river rock. Well, I grew up in Iowa. We didn't have any river rocks to get, and rivers to get smooth. So I cheated. I went to Lowe's and you can buy 
a bag of polished stones in the <laughs> garden section. Well then. So I have a smooth, smooth river rock from the river lows. <laughs> nice. So I, I'm just going to hold this up again. This is the stem that I made last night. I wasn't sure if it was going to be for this piece or not. It seems to fit fairly well. So I'm just trying to hold it on top of the piece that I've been trimming, this little puck, because that's what's going to make the surface contact in the top of the stem. And it's a little bit tall still. So I'm going to trim the top of this down. And I'm also going to bring the diameter in a little bit. We'll see if I can get this assembled. The stem is still pretty wet. I let it dry on the bat overnight. And it didn't really dry because it was on the bat. <laughs> so, Kirk, you talked about your wheel survey. Um, I don't think I mentioned what yes, I am oh. doing. Yes, Amanda, what are you doing in 171 for a online I, class? I am going to be doing a kids survey. Um, and this is going to be open to anybody eight and above. But, you know, I wouldn't rule out if an adult wants to watch with somebody younger and hang out and, and see clay stuff. They could do that too, but that's going to be Wednesdays. So Kirk's is on Monday. Mine will be on Wednesday from six to seven. You can come hang out and watch and ask questions about five different clay projects. We're going to do a different project each meeting. And the first one I have up is salt and pepper shakers. And it's all going to be hand building techniques. We're not going to do anything on the wheel because this is stuff that you could potentially be doing at home. And we'll be putting pictures up of what some of those projects can look like. I made a bunch last night as demonstrations. And um, we'll put them up on the website. So I have salt and pepper shakers, uh, a heart-shaped box, um, a set of nesting bowls. So typically a set of nesting bowls is at least three. Um, mine's three. We could make it five or seven, whatever. Um, and a chia pet. That's only four. Bird feeder. Bird feeder's the other one. <laughs> so in theory, the chia pet works. I don't actually have any chia seeds, so I'm going to have to get them and try it out. But it's just going to be a... Um, a bisque fired pot that we keep wet and we put wet chia seeds on and eventually they'll germinate and grow and your chia pet will have hair. <laughs> Only it'll be one of a kind and unique because you made it. Um, interesting question about the, the chia growing thing. Mm -hmm. I have seen that you can get, like, go to your home and garden center and get grass seed that you can put on the top of a cinder block and it will grow. Ooh, fun. Could we, could we also put, like, do do that same thing with your chia pet, possibly? I bet you could. Just going to low I think the chia seeds sprout faster. Okay. So it depends how patient you are. <laughs> And whether you want to mow it when it's done? Right. Mitchell has returned. I have. You can tell because my dogs are barking in the background. <laughs> They're cheering us on, I think. Yeah. So we're still we're still working on Martha's technical issues. I think she's going to try to join by her phone, although okay. she's going to be a little behind. Um, yeah. But while I'm here, I thought I would ask... Um, what is what are some of your favorite forms to make? Mm. Kirk, do you want to go first? I can go first. I my favorite form to make is bowls. Yeah. Um just when I'm in that mood where I just want to make something but I don't want to have to be, you know, 
really emotionally involved or uh, emotion i guess mentally to really hard, think about it really hard like you know cranking out bowls is it's just a a wonderful shape and there are so many different forms you can do we'll talk about this in my my throwing wheel throwing class when we do bowls you can do a bowl that's curved then it's this shape and you can do a bowl that's flared out in that shape and you can do a bowl where you can modify the rims and you can do you can do big bowls you can do small bowls and you know for some reason ice cream always tastes better out of a handmade bowl than it does when you bought from walmart oh i totally so, agree <laughs> so and i have this get this pleasure out of using my stuff that i've made because as i eat from it or drink from it i can see the 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 artistry that i have that's been put into it and enjoy the container as much as i am enjoying the product that's inside so nice bowls are my favorite i i would have to agree bowls are are my favorite as well um I like making drinking vessels, but bowls are just more satisfying for me. I tend to get more of them quicker than when I'm making something to drink from. Um, there's something satisfying about the shape. And because I have more practice, because I prefer to make them, I feel like I'm better at making bowls than any of my other pieces. And I would go a step further and say hand building, it's a tie between monsters and tiles. Tiles you don't really build, but <laughs> you can cut them. So they're all kind of a little bit different and it really depends on my mood for the day of what, <laughs> what I'm preferring. Mm -hmm. Amanda, when you make a bowl, what shape do you like the most? Oh, I, I go for a uh, deep wide U shape with okay. a little bit of a flare at the top. Okay. Yeah. Similar to the, the thing I'm trimming right now, which I think I have to the correct measurement. Let's try the stem. Ha ha. It fits. So <laughs> now we got to get this on, which is going to be trickier because my stem is still wet and the bowl is dry. So I'm going to use a fork and rough this up. I spent all this time burnishing it. <laughs> I'm going to undo that. <laughs> and I'm scoring with a serrated rib. It's got serrations on the ends, on the edges. If I want really deep ones, I found this. Ooh, yeah. like, what is its yeah. original function? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it might be uh, like a, to do like scratch coat in like tiling. Oh, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Now, I trimmed that full round. Now I'm going to make... I'm going to start making the, the foot. Excellent. So because you haven't really fired that uh, combined clay that you've made, what what's your guess as to shrinkage for it? Um, I don't know what the shrinkage is for the, the black clay solo. I know that the shrinkage for my Raku clay firing to cone six is about 13%. Mm, okay. So if the, 
if it's dark brown clay, this black clay is also about 13%. I'll probably still maintain 13%. Yeah. If it's, if it's higher than that, because I don't have an exact, I haven't weighed out the amount of clay that I mixed together. I just sort of just do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the chaos concept. Um, it's going to, you know, so that the black clay has got a shrinkage of 15% and my Clay is 13. I'm going to guess if I make a 15. Martha! Hi there. Can you hear me? Oh, we, Martha back. We, we can hear, hear you. Here. You can? Yes. yes. <gasps> <laughs> All right, Martha, you got some catching up to do. <laughs> so, what is, so I'm on a now I'm on a phone and I can't even see what you guys are doing. So where are you guys at in the process? I <laughs> am re ready to attach a stem to... <laughs> bowl okay okay and so you so you scored you've trimmed and scored the the dish the bowl part of it right yes okay and we'll see if i can get it to stick <laughs> so so are you both starting with a ring of clay now to Amanda, when you throw your stems do you throw them upside down, which means the bowl part is on the wheel head and then the foot part is up? Or do you throw them with the, the foot down and the um, bowl up, right side up? I throw both parts right side up, but I am okay. now assembling them upside down. Okay, right. Now, when you once you assemble your piece... I guess I could wait and ask this later. Once you sem once you put the foot, the stem on your bowl, then do you go back to your stem and throw some more on it, or do you trim it out? Because it's going to be thicker, um, right, at the bottom? Yeah, it is going to be thicker. I think I may have to trim it. I'm going to have to wait to do that because while it was on the bat drying, there was water in there that I forgot to soak up. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit mushy right now. Okay. It might stiffen up enough for me to do that trimming. So right now I'm just trying to work on the joint between the top of the stem and the bottom of the bowl. So it's a little bit more integrated. Okay. So Martha, you were gonna ask something. You can't hear me, can you? We can hear you. Or you can, all right. Oh, wonderful. So I was asking, um, do you, because I, can't see very well from here. Um, are you starting with just a ring of clay or have you thrown part of the stem when you put it onto the cup part? Um, so it's a hollow stem. So I opened it on the wheel. I went all the way down to the, the wheel head, the mm -hmm. back, and then pulled it upwards like you would for a cylinder. Okay, but it's, and it I, start. It started like ahead. a little, like a little tire, then, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. So right now I am adding a small coil around the joint of the stem and the bowl, so that I can try and integrate them a little bit more, which might not work because I'm working with different levels of wetness on each part. Uh -huh. We'll see. Try not to add too much more water back into this, but. And I'm doing this on the foam bat. This isn't tamped down with any lugs oh. or anything. Wow. Tempting fate, I think. I just put a little coil on using a little bit of my uh, damp sponge to kind of compress and push that on there so it's integrated. But of course, I'm bringing up all the grog doing that because I am using our wood fire clay for this. Oh, that's oh. cool. So, Martha, we were talking about um, 
the classes that we're going to start offering. So Kirk talked about his. I think I just finished talking about the kids survey. What are you going to be offering? Uh, I'm offering a, a hand building class. It'll be on thurs Thursdays at the same time as the other classes are. And we're going to be starting with simple slab construction. In fact, we're going to be starting with things that only require one slab, but you manipulate it. And then we'll move up to vases and to um, mugs that will require a bunch of different pieces being manipulated and then added together. So um, I'm hoping that um, we'll, we'll be building skills and we certainly are going to start with more slabs, but we will do a coil construction on the the middle week, somewhere near toward the middle of the of the whole thing. So, and we start next Thursday. Excellent. What would you say about who could join your class? Do they have to have any clay experience? No, I'm, I'm building it so that you don't have to have any clay experience. And if you have some clay at home, you can make a long um, and I will put out, uh, for anybody who registers, I will put out a list of the supplies that you should have or you would be good to have. We're going to work very hard on uh, making sure that all the tools that a person needs are things that they can adapt from their own houses. And the clay would be the one thing that maybe people need to wait on until they can, they can purchase some clay. And the idea would be that they can watch and they can ask questions and it's be you know, anybody who's a teenager and up through adulthood is welcome to come join in. Excellent. Have you talked about the ability to fire one piece? Yeah, we briefly touched on that. So we'll go further into it. At the end of our five-week class, which will bring us to almost the end of June, um, students are going to have the ch chance to pick one of the five projects from whatever class they've signed up for. And they're gonna kind of make an order form for us. We're gonna assemble a kit that has the appropriate amount of clay in it. And that can go home. We might be able to do stuff in the studio. Um, that'll require some scheduling to make sure that we're adhering to social distancing protocols, but um, that might be a possibility. Mm -hmm. And then once people have completed their project, <clears throat> they'll bring it back to 171. And um, they'll be able to pick a glaze for it to be finished with. And we will apply that and in a few weeks after dropping it off, hopefully, we will get it back to people. So they'll watch every week of the class mm -hmm. and then choose one project from among those and make them at home with, chances are, make them at home and go from there as far as uh, the finishing of it. You'll fire it and then they'll have a chance to pick the color glaze. Do I have that right? You got it. Okay, good thing. So we're hoping that we might be able to offer students toolkits to purchase because we don't currently sell any tools at 171. But a lot of things have to happen before we can say that that's a for sure thing. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, maybe. But Amanda, just to give you a piece of information, I cannot hear Martha. So I don't think Again? she needs to do anything about it necessarily, even though I'd love to hear Martha. So if she <laughs> asks me a question, just let me know and I'll just ask, ask me the question again and I'll be glad to answer it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> she can hear you. I can. Oh, because I can't say anything bad about her. I got it. Uh -huh. well, you can. well, you can, but you shouldn't. <laughs> She says you shouldn't, <laughs> but you can. <laughs> Martha, one of the questions I had asked while you were out was, um, what's your favorite form to create on? Well, my which, yeah. My favorite. Uh, I think that when I want to be relaxed and just enjoy uh, with no anxiety at all, I think bowls. There's something about baking plates and bowls that are, um, it's quite relaxing 
the way that you use the rib across it or to pull it up, I find that quite relaxing. Um, but it's not quite as challenging as other things. So I would say the most relaxing are bowls. Um, I do like achieving a new thing. So probably bowls and then what's a new thing that I saw or I want to adapt and then I want to create. So then then it's like, it's not exactly one form, but it's the idea of finding something or, or imagining something mm -hmm. and then applying my imagination to it and try and make it. So sort of an answer to your question, but not exactly. No, oh, great. It seems like bowl is the popular answer today. Is it? Um, <laughs> yes, that's what we all answered. Uh -huh. So Kirk Martha says that bowls are her favorite thing to make too. <laughs> There's just something about the rhythm of making a bowl. Yep. Yep. It's like, is that a chalice you're making there, Kirk, or a bird bath? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. How much wine do you like? <laughs> so right now what I'm doing, I have my stem and my bowl married so that they are now potentially a chalice and I'm using my mirror like we mentioned before uh, to kind of refine the shape and the profile of this because it's a little bit awkward looking so I want smooth elegant curves and right now it's a little choppy when you um when you join something together like that, is does that create any problems during firing or how do you prevent that from? Good, good question. Yes, it certainly can create problems, um, which I am definitely gonna be facing because I am assembling pieces of clay that aren't at the same consistency of wetness. So when we have unequal dampness with parts of clay, it means that they're drying differently at different rates. And those different rates can cause cracks and warpage and all sorts of disasters. Some which may not present themselves until after you have fired it. So um, the other part that could have happened, which I won't know until later on is I may have trapped a little bit of air in here. And it's a common misconception that it's air bubbles that cause explosions. It's not wholly true. Steam is what causes explosions. And steam is generated on thick pieces that might still be damp at the core, even though the outside is dry and free of moisture but as that heats up at that magical point of 212 degrees in the kiln the steam's going to look for a way to get out and that usually is what results in an explosion or at the very least cracking so when I'm done with this this is going to go in my damp box which is just a plastic tote bin with a layer of plaster in the bottom of it, which will kind of work to keep everything damp, hence its name, <laughs> and dry it slowly. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a potter. Does war page mean anything to anyone? Leanne Butler Warren asked war page? Question mark. <laughs> That would be my mom. I'm not quite sure what she's asking. <laughs> Warpage, maybe? Oh, she, maybe. She's, oh. Wondering, she's wondering about she's your English about language warping? education. Is, do we have a problem with things warping? No, she's wondering about she's wondering about your language skills, I think. <laughs> yes. Well, as clay people, um, we have lots of different corks, and making up words is one of them. <laughs> If it was my father asking the question, I'd say we don't have as much problem with warpage as he does, but. <laughs> All right. Warpage. Yes. Warpage. 
right. Oh, and the size of this pot is Amanda's fault. Because <laughs> I told you to make something ridiculous. No, I asked you how big of how big of a piece you're going to make, and you said four pounds. So I made a a cup, a bowl cup, out of three pounds of clay, and then this is three pounds sitting on top of it. So it's the yes, cup is four part pounds. Of my plan. It's all part of my plan, Kirk. <laughs> Setting you up for failure. <laughs> And now, because um, well, Martha indicated that she had to make sure that the pedestal was twice as tall as the as the bowl, I have to make my pedestal twice as tall as the bowl, right? Oh, yes. Is this like sabotage? All my friends right. trying to sabotage me too. That's right. Question, I question, question everything. <laughs> so, Martha, real what? Martha, what are you doing there with your little, uh, your stick in your... So I, I have narrowed this such that I can't get my hand inside. Also, my hand is not long enough. My arm's not long enough to go down something. It's, so it's too narrow and it's too tall for me to get my arm down there. So if this is called a throwing stick. And my particular throwing stick was made by friend Alan from the Pottery Studio, who uh, has also made a, a goblet. Um, for this competition, um, but he's just not on on air, <laughs> pretty much like I wasn't. But um, so this is a throwing stick, and what it does is it replaces my pressure from the inside because I can't get my hand in there, and because you very rarely want to have pressure just from one side. There are times when you do, but you want to you want to balance the pressure. So this replaces my hand in doing it. I think maybe it was. Um... Alan Peckham, who made yes, your throwing the, stick? Oh, I'm sorry. What did I say? Fred Allen. It's a new person. I have not met him. <laughs> I don't know Fred Allen. So Alan Peckham, that's who I met. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So Mitchell, Fred, I also no, have a... I said friend Allen. Friend, but maybe uh, didn't come across. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, yeah. This is another throwing stick. This is from Sim Tools. This one's silicone. It's long like Martha's, except this is flexible. So I could bend this one. Mm -hmm. So it could go in the neck of a vase and then push outwards to make something really bulbous and um, round. So they're good tools to have around. Okay, I think this one might be done. So you have the whole thing done? Yes, oh ta-da. Competition over. <laughs> That's what I get. <laughs> Are you oh trying my... to say you won? Yeah. <laughs> I won't go that far, but... Oh, flaws on the inside, though. I'll hold this up so you can see it. So I was getting aggressive with my trimming. I don't know if you can see, but right in there, I've gotten a little bit thin. So this is probably going to crack. That's so not enjoy, heavy. It. enjoy it while you can. <laughs> What's my height measurement? Let's check. We're at, let's call it nine and a half. That's a nine and three quarters tall at least and width wise for the bowl it's six and a half depth of the bowl is three and a half Whoop. I will tell you right now it's it's a little top heavy <laughs> So I'm going to set that behind and I'm going to do some throwing. Save that trimming for later. So I see you just changed out the plate on your 
wheel? How what? How do you determine what? Is there a determination of what plate you're going to use, or it's just these? I just have a collection of themes. These are called bats. This is what a dirty bat looks like. <laughs> um, the ones that we have from 171 are blue or brown, <clears throat> and they have holes on the bottom of them. Those fit on two pins that are on our wheel head, and that keeps it in place. So this just allows us to switch between pieces without having to touch a really wet, wobbly piece and distort it. Except if you have a wheel like mine and the bat pins are thicker than the holes in the bat, <clears throat> And then you nick it, pulling it off of the wheel. <laughs> so that's always fun. <laughs> I don't think she means it. <laughs> so I'll just get my, my clay balled up. I'm ready to throw this down on the wheel. Martha, what clay are you using? I right now I'm using stoneware, the five five three stoneware. Um, <clears throat> the I had been practicing with with porcelain, which is the studio's um, cone five six porcelain, as you know, um, which is whiter. But I think right now this all looks white, right? But um, this this will fire, as you know, to a buff color, unlike the porcelain, which fires to a true white color. Nice. They both take glaze very nicely, as you know. So we have a question for you, Martha. Are you making uh, two pieces or just one large piece? I am making two pieces, but I don't know what my friends here are doing. So Amanda was doing one and adding on, so she makes one piece. Is that correct? Correct. Think, yes. and, what's, and what's Kirk doing? He did it in two parts and then married them. And he's already done that? Correct. His piece is upside down right now, bowl side down with the stem up. Ha ha. Okay. So I'm so far behind. Okay. <clears throat> well, I have a solution for that. Hold on. <laughs> Are going to see magic of television. magic? Yeah. <laughs> Is that your wheel, Amanda? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just coning my clay up and down, getting it ready to open up. I'm going to make the bowl the top part of a chalice first. So Kirk, how's your piece going? It's going pretty well. I'm just going to scrape some of the um, slip off the outside. And then I need to remove some moisture from the inside. And I have got a, you're talking about funky tools. I've got a funky tool for that. I've got a common referred to as a sponge on a stick. Sponge on a stick. And this is one of those, um, what do you buy a potter for Christmas? <laughs> Things they may never use again. But So this is my sponge on a stick, except. Oh, the sponge, it, is that a SIM tool? The X-I-E-M tool? I'm not sure. I didn't buy it. <laughs> but I can reach a long way in, down into this. You can. I got one of those for the studio. Um, yeah. 
and we killed the sponge. One of one of the models has a removable sponge head, kind of like a paint roller. So when yeah. you do that, you can replace it. Ours, of course, did not have that. The drawback I found with using it is if you put any pressure on that telescoping wand, it pushed itself back in. <laughs> yes. I didn't remember that, but I only use it when I have to, when I have to, I don't use it very often. So mm -hmm. this is my sponge on a stick. Oop. So it's a cylindrical sponge. It's integrated and glued well onto this dowel. Uh -huh. And of course we have the like makeshift sponge on a stick where it's one of the yellow sponges that you just put on a dowel with a rubber band. <laughs> Okay, that's what I used to use, and my wife laughed at me. Well, you know, so, a lot of powder so she got powders make their own fancy tools. One. Yeah. And the reason the handle is orange is because orange is my wife's favorite color. Is it? So, <laughs> so you have to think of Denise every time you use it. I do think of Denise every time I use it. It's like, <laughs> my city got me sponge on a stick. So Martha, what are you doing? Well, I pre-threw the stem because I knew that I couldn't join them. I didn't think I could join them in the same day. I also didn't know I'd have uh, abbreviated time with you. So I am slipping and scoring. So I am making a, the surface rough on each of them. I'd already measured to see that they fit together like puzzle pieces. And then I am putting slip, which is watered down clay in a sense, muddy, soupy clay, so that it can do that, what we've called a Velcro bond between the two pieces. So I'm getting them ready to get married. Nice. I should have made sure that they still fit together though before I did this. So this could be somewhat mysterious here. <laughs> so Kirk, Martha is getting ready to attach the bowl to her stem. She scratched uh -huh. and slipped them. Martha, is your stem still attached to the bat? It is because every time I've done this in the past, I've not been able to anchor the stem well. So um, this is my experience speaking to me here. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that last night when I was um, making my pieces ahead for today and I cut it off the bat. <laughs> ah. I'm sure I'm sh you can compensate. I'm sure you can. Yeah, I don't you know that I would have attached it the way that I just did before with the bowl uh, and the stem. I think I probably would have gone the route that you're doing with the stem on the bat right side up with the bowl on top of it like, mm -hmm. like that. And then once it's seated the way I want it to be, then I've got to find a way to put pressure on it so that they come together. Kirk, it looks like you're adding some decoration or design to yours. Is that correct? I, I did. I added a pattern to the design. It was looking pretty, um, it looked like the it could use some more interest. <laughs> so I added some pattern to it. How did and you do that, I'm Kirk? Doing is because oh. I've been throwing on a piece that's been sitting on the wheel that's been lugged on with clay. I've uh -huh. got a slip line that's just below that pattern that I'm going to take off because it's been pooling up there and I don't want it to pool up there anymore. So now, because the bottom, well, I guess it's the top, is leather hard and the upper portion is actually um, freshly thrown, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this whole unit and sit it aside and let the two Wrap it up in plastic and let the two get to the same thickness before I let it dry out any further. But there it is, upside down. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Ha! Does that look like a goblet? It does. It does. I, I am doing some um, flipping in my head to <laughs> see, see it as a goblet. Okay. Let's see. I could take my phone and flip it over. <laughs> but... If I flip it over now, the foot will collapse. 
Yeah. Don't do that. And we will lose the whole thing. So the next Mar question is, should I do another one? It's only 10 after 1. Uh, yeah, you I can, can join me. Started. Yeah. <laughs> keep, me, keep me company. So the first thing I'm going to do is send her another bowl. Martha says you can keep her company. Because I'll, I'll keep throwing in a minute. I would love to keep Martha company. It's Thank you. an interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to try a technique on. It doesn't look very much like a bowl right now. Um, it's a technique that I watched Simon Levin do. Ah. He, he does it on small cups that he calls tulip cups. He facets the edges or the outside, and then he'll throw from the inside to stretch it out. Mm hmm. Okay. And if I can get it to work, it might create a bowl that has, like, slight peaks to it all the way around the rim. Oh, which, yeah. Which could look like a crown. And it could be a corona, per se. Oh, she's, uh -huh. she's, she's working this, yes. We'll see. Bye, so we had we had David Foster ask why are some of you working bull rim down and some are working bull rip up, rib up. Um, what was it that made you make the decision on how you were piecing yours together? Ah. So mm -hmm. for me, for me, it was. Um, I'll go first. Oh, wait, wait, go ahead. Reason I wait. <laughs> Martha, Martha, was actually, Martha, Martha was going Kirk. <laughs> Right, I'll my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is from personal experience because the bowl I found if it was face down when I was putting up the very thin neck of the stem, it could for me wobble back and forth a little bit more. Whereas the bowl seems to be more structurally, I don't know, weighted or sound. I'm guessing there's a physics reason for it that the way that the bowl comes down, it's less likely it's going to be blowing in the breeze or taking the centrifugal force in a bad way. Also, I don't center incredibly well when I'm doing this. And so if I did it perfectly, it wouldn't be a problem. And I'm thinking that's why Kirk's works so well. Whereas I'm always fussing a little bit because I'm probably off center. Hmm. That's so, so Kirk, you actually did yours opposite of Martha. You did yours pulled full down. Um, what was what was the impetus for that decision? I'm doing a little bit of a different technique. I believe both Martha and Amanda are throwing the bowl and the stem separately, then combining them together. Well, I'm actually throwing the stem section on the bowl once I trim it. So that, and because the bowl is going to be the widest base that I have, it's easier mm -hmm. to put that down and then throw the stem on it than to try doing the narrow stem and all that height and throw that big bowl on top of it. Good question, so that's honey. Why I'm doing mine upside down. <laughs> so I just faceted around the outside of my what is going to be the bowl. And hopefully I can get some of that tulip cup action a la. Uh, Simon Levin. <laughs> we'll see. So Amanda, earlier you talked about putting your piece into plastic. We had Barbara ask, um, if you put something in plastic, does that help the moisture between the two pieces even out? It definitely can, yes. Um, so we use garbage bags, typically cl the clay bags that the clay comes in are really good because they're a little bit heavier plastic. So they keep everything in the moisture that is and um, can help things homogenize so that they become equal in their dampness or evened out. So it takes patience <laughs> more than anything else, but plastic can help. If you do have a damp box, 
which usually entails just having some sort of container with maybe about an inch of plaster on the bottom of it. The plaster retains moisture so that it is like perpetually dampening your piece. It's like marinating in a greenhouse. So <laughs> when you have access to that, that's preferable, but plastic is still totally viable for that option to kind of get things back together and equal in wetness. All right, so I just opened this into more of a bowl shape. I don't know if I left myself enough clay to actually do this faceting. That's always the hard part with faceting. You have to give yourself enough clay to actually cut away and that by the time you stretch it that it's not totally <laughs> thinned out. That's kind of what I was going for. <laughs> So stretched it out and kind of swirled those so that they're not vertical facets. But what I was really going for was that kind of scallopy edge that looks maybe like a crown. Nice. We'll see if that survives. How many pounds of clay are you guys using? I don't know if you've already talked about this and I'm sorry if I'm repeating. <laughs> um, well, Kirk said he was using four pounds because that's what I said. Um, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that. I am. A... I'm just eyeballing and um, imagining these as pieces of fruit. <laughs> uh huh. So I had a grapefruit for a bowl. Uh huh. And I have a tangerine for a stem. Of course you do. Okay. <laughs> and actually, I wimped out. I only went to three pounds. Oh, boy. Total or for your... Okay. Are you e using equal size pieces for each part, Kirk? Yes. Okay. So that's three pounds each or a total of three pounds? Three pounds each, I think. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to end up with a six pound goblet. Yep. Uh, Looks like a donut right now, Kirk. What I'm doing right now is I just threw a center and a big donut. And I just want to be able to lift it off the piece. And then I can put this back on. Because I don't want to do the downward force onto the bowl to do the the hard centering part of it. Mm -hmm. So when your bowl is upside down like that, have you trimmed it already? I trimmed it. I trimmed it and put it, mounted it, centered it on there, trimmed it, and left it on, attached to the wheel. And now I can throw this this wad on it and get it to work work them together and get it to center up. So Martha, and you can't really up. see what Kirk is doing right now. So he has his bowl upside uh -huh. down, attached to the bat with lugs, and okay. he's putting this ring of clay on the what's the base of the bowl. Yes, okay. So he's going to throw that ring as the stem. Yes, okay. <clears throat> I have done that, and there's something really organic then about the, the final vessel. There's something, I don't know, it's easier for me to see how things and would I go together. Put a lot of downward force on it because sure, you can crush your lower bowl. And at this point, i got to be a little bit careful because I can't put a lot of Moisture. Grab it really hard because I'll rip this donut of clay off the bowl. 
Would somebody ask him if he's throwing dry? Kirk, would you say you're throwing dry? Which is always fun. More than you usually yeah. would? No, I throw pretty dry on a regular basis. Mm. I have, let's see, give me an idea. I have not cleaned my wheel in probably, oh gosh, eight months. <laughs> and I think that's against okay. coronavirus protocols, buddy. And I have just a very thin layer of material on the side of my wheel. So like I've got trimmings in my wheel and they won't, the trimmings won't get very wet at all. Kirk, uh, Martha says that's against quarantine protocols. <laughs> Me and my wheel have been quarantined together. <laughs> for, for people who are watching. I have not spilled any Corona beer on the wheel. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> the corollary that Kirk is making is that the, all the, the moisture that's here the, the water that we put on ends up in the tray. And he's saying that he just doesn't end up with a lot there because he doesn't use a lot when he's throwing. So he throws dry or closer to dry. And for comparison, I am throwing fairly wet. <clears throat> so I create a lot more slip and goo on my hands, which I have to kind of constantly clean off. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I find that this wood fire clay just creates that slip a lot easier or um, faster than the 553, which is what you're using, Martha. Right. Um, so part of that is because this batch of clay itself is pretty soft and it just wants to shear off and kind of dissolve into that slip. <clears throat> I really so like I had the sound of Amanda's wheel. It's very yeah. soothing. <laughs> could oh, offer this. To say, Mar Martha? Uh, wait, this is something else. But we could offer this on the 171 Facebook page just of Amanda's sound and the going around of the clay for people when they feel stressed. You know, just like go to 171 for stress relief. Just watch it go round and round and round. Yes, we'll have an ASMR channel in that will. We'll yes. Do some sensory meditation for people. They can listen to the wheel and then they can just watch the clay go up and down. So what I was going to say is I was proposing because I had learned a two thirds, one third proportion for a chalice or a goblet was do Amanda and Kirk have a different aesthetic, different sensibility about that? Um, for me, I've, so I've made a few goblets and chalices. Um, it wasn't as academic as me actually measuring them. Mm -hmm. I was purely eyeballing. <laughs> sure. I guess the idea was not, not 50%, 50%, not half. Mm, sure. That there's something that like attaches it to earth that way. It's not, there's no lift. Certainly. Um, I, I think that's not far off from what I end up actually doing. Uh -huh. But like the one that I just put together, I would say the stem is thinner than what that bowl actually needs. Uh -huh. Thus making it somewhat tippy. So you tippy, tipsy, yeah, we're not going there. Okay. <laughs> it's um, an innate sobriety test. I, I see. I see. I'm sure. I am sure you can fill my goblets full of bourbon, drink the whole thing, and not get tipsy. They're not that big. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's only a bottle. <laughs> Her, um, you probably didn't hear Martha's question, but she was asking, "Is your?" Bowl and stem, are you using the same amount of clay or are you using less for one part than you are for the other? I'm using the same amount of clay. So right now I'm throwing it's a three-pound ball of clay for the bowl and then it's a three-pound ball of clay for the stem. And that last one I think is 
13 inches tall. So slightly taller than Amanda's. Yes. <laughs> 13 inches? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So I would say, Martha, earlier we were discussing what Kirk's um, clay shrinkage might be. He's thinking somewhere between, you know, like 12 or 13 percent. Uh-huh. So by the time that's done, it's, it's maybe only going to be like 11 and a half inches. <laughs> <laughs> if that that's makes off. you feel better. <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, so you guys don't have this sensation or sensory experience, but there's a, a rubber puck wheel that's attached to the motor, which is actually what spins my um, flywheel. Okay. And I am burning rubber right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> smell a vision Yes. So Mitchell, have you ever thrown? Me? No, I I have not. I the close the most I've ever done was um, I hand built um, some bowls with backyard clay when Ooh. I was like seven. <laughs> like, <laughs> the most I've done with clay. There's nothing wrong with backyard clay. That's right. It actually gives you some cred. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When I was in Wilmington, we used to dig the clay out of the retention pond behind my house. And we've actually fired that clay into cone 10 straight out of the ground, which meant when you were throwing it, you had to be not complain too much about the sticks you encountered. <laughs> <laughs> what color was it, Kirk? When it came out of the ground, it was this sort of purpley blue. Ooh. And had this very distinctive odor. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, of course it did. And when it fires, because it had a high salt content, if you would let your piece sit, and the clay would oxidize to this nice dark brown color on the outside as it would dry out. But then if you trim it, it would go and, it'd come, and the clay would fire out to this peachy color. And so we... I discovered is if you let your clay dry a little bit and then re-wedge it, you'd get this, the oxidized clay, you could get, work it back in so you get this brown fleck. Interesting. So it was like peach ice cream with um, chocolate flecks in it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was, it was fun. The only problem we found that we, it had is after you used it, it did not like going to the dishwasher. Really? What what happened? It would well, um, yeah. it would punk and crack. And what we think is, even at cone ten, it didn't necessarily get fully vitrified. It was always still a little bit porous. For those who are listening, cone ten is pretty high. It's it's higher than what we do at one seventy one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's twenty one. No, twenty two hundred degrees. It's about twenty three, twenty four hundred degrees. We fire cone six is like 2150. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes, it is. So what qualities are going to make for the winner of the quarantine cup? What are people looking for? Are they looking for volume? They're looking for panache and style. <laughs> I, I thought we would just we would just leave it open to the to the masses to decide which one they like and not give many quality okay. quantity or qualifications. Kirk, can you hear Martha now? Yes, I can. Hi. Whoa. I thought that he was <laughs> I thought he was just coincidentally um, answering my questions. <laughs> she so came I just, back. I just did a silly thing and thought, hey, I'll facet my stem, but that's not gonna Whoa. work. <laughs> What happened? Well, I have to get it to go taller, so um, that's not real practical. 
I'm gonna start over. <clears throat> Noise. Noise. We've made it to the hour and a half mark. Can you believe it? It looks like. Whoa. Wow. So you guys have. We've just. Thirty minutes. Thirty get minutes. Get in your play questions. So. <laughs> So Mitchell has watching us really like enticed you into getting your hands into clay. Well, watching you and I mean also my office being like, well, when we're actually in our building, my office yeah. being you know thirty feet or less from the clay <laughs> studio. I keep telling my, I keep threatening myself that I'm going to go back there and learn some things. Someday. Look out! <laughs> you might learn something. <laughs> All right, my wheel is uh, creaky. Definitely fun to watch. So, so did Amanda? Oh, go did ahead, Amanda and Kirk? No, did Amanda and Kirk answer some very fascinating questions while I was gone? Are there things I would learn about them and their history in clay? No, yeah. we never talked about our history. Oh, okay. No, no we didn't. It's okay. It's okay. I just didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I, I f believe it or not, I actually find the, the collection that we instructors we currently have at 170 very fascinating because we sort of run <clears throat> the educational gamut of people in clay. Yeah, there you I go. Mean, because Martha is very much a, a studio learned potter you basically learned at 171 i sure did yep and so your your skill set is a product of what 171 the, the 171 program right right and then my skill set is i did go to college and my emphasis in college with my i have an art degree throwing pottery and then once again, it's a lot of, I've done a lot of workshops and worked in, in studios and under the tutelage of other instructors. Uh huh. And then Amanda, she actually went to a really good pottery school <laughs> <laughs> and got her education. So it's... Where she still stole spoons from. Long term borrowed, Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> Indefinite loan. <laughs> this is on international broadcast here, Amanda. <laughs> so, President Zupin, if you are watching, um, I will return your spoon. <laughs> um, you're right, Kirk. We do have kind of the full gamut of how clay has brought people together. So I, I did go to Alfred. Um, I was not planning on going to art school. In ninth grade, I was pretty certain I was going to go to med school. Uh -huh. but, um, I took studio and art, which is one of the required courses for ninth and tenth graders. And my high school art teacher for that class, Mr. Turin, was a potter. So he had a couple of wheels in his room. We got to do clay with him. And I liked it. And then I kept hanging out in his room, like, after school or mm -hmm. my study halls. <laughs> and I didn't leave. So <laughs> I got to take my turn on the wheel because there weren't enough wheels for us to do it in class. It just wasn't oh, oh. So to learn how to throw on the wheel. I, I had to do it after school with him and I did. And I liked it enough to <laughs> change my course and say, Hey mom, dad, um, I want to go to art school. <laughs> and I did with the caveat that I would have a parachute backup plan and go into teaching as well. Um, but with kind of our recession and 
change of focus in school settings, art teachers are kind of one of the first positions that end up getting cut when budgets are being yeah. retooled each year. So um, not a great backup plan. Um, so after I graduated, I substitute taught for about six months and decided to keep my momentum going and just go right into grad school to get my master's for education. Um, for a New York State certification, you have to have your master's. So that's what I decided I needed to just keep going with that and went to Syracuse, was an accelerated program that only needed to be a year because I had done my student teaching while I was at Alfred. So that cut a whole year off of my graduate program. And I graduated in 2012 and started applying to as many jobs as I could. The downside is in this location, this region of New York State, one art teacher position would have 500 people applying to it. So some of my, my classmates had stuck around and, and were also applying for the same jobs I were, was doing. And um, there's just too many overqualified people for the one position. So substitute teaching came back into the picture. And I wanna say in 2013, I cold called 171 and said, hey, I'm an educator in the area. You're an arts organization. Let's meet. <laughs> so at that point in time, Courtney DeRussia was our program manager and I met with her and um, she said, fill out a class proposal form. I know Kirk and Martha, you're familiar with those. Those are fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And is that, is that when you did the totem poles? Yes, the totem pole workshop was my first class. So I offered that. We made sculptural pieces and then threaded them on pieces of rebar, thus making a totem to go outside in the garden. And um, in 2014, Lynn Wagner kind of retired as our technician and the position became open and I got another call saying, hey, you wanna come back and do this position instead? So I officially started as 171 employee, well, in a full-time capacity in September of 2014. So I've obviously been here since then. I think this is a fairly unique position. And one of the things that I like about it so much is that I get to work with lots of different age groups and each day is a little bit different. You get to do the technical stuff like loading kilns and making glaze and keeping inventory of stuff. But then I get to teach and kind of experiment and make my own work. And Amanda, be, oh, go ahead, Martha. No, Amanda has that. Um, rare combination of right brain, left brain. So she could create very well. She's very imaginative, but she also does spreadsheets very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like being able to uh, at least color code the spreadsheets. <laughs> There's that artistic flair coming back into it. I'm sure Kim really appreciates all of those bright colors. <laughs> Our spreadsheets, <laughs> but I get to work with a pretty amazing team of people, um, and not only with our instructors, but just our core core staff doing Amanda? some of the administrative stuff. Yes, we Mitchell. Had, we had Kimberly Canali comment that she would really like you to offer that totem workshop again. 
Ooh. the life resumes. Because she would love to take that. I will add it to the list of possibilities, Kim. <laughs> we could try and do that again, for sure. Kirk, a minute ago you had a strange tool that looked like a pair of pliers and a... I'm not sure what was attached to it. Oh, yeah. Oh, a Steve okay. tool. Oh, boy. I don't know what that is. It's a, it's, a tex it's, just, it's a texture tool that's got sprockets on it, and you can actually get different sprockets to go on it to make textures. And mm -hmm. what that does is we'll show you on the, on the first one I did. It's because the same thing. When you it rolls, and then if you can see that, you can see the... It's to keep the light, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the yeah. texture that it puts on the side. Ah. And one of the things that usually I try to texture the piece when it is the, the, the consistency, the soft consistency that the stems are, and not leather hard like the, like the bodies. So the bodies are pretty hard to get stuff into because it's, it's, it's a much firmer clay. And because that's got points on it, it really digs in. So that's the second one. Oh gosh, I should do this too while I'm thinking about it. One of the questions that's going to come up is how tall is it? This one is 13 and a half inches. <laughs> nice. The other one is 12 and a quarter. <laughs> I'm trying to get some height in the stem right now. I seem to like be stagnant at like seven inches. So Amanda, how many of these do you want to fire? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I would say go ahead and bring all of them in. We'll see which ones actually survive the car ride to the studio. <laughs> At the current rate I'm going, I might have the whole top shelf of the kiln if I'm not careful. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. Well, because I've got other large stuff. I, I made that faceted pot. That means that's essentially got to go in. Oh, yes, your hand-built one. There's another faceted pot that's that's at 171 that needs to go in. <laughs> yeah, currently on the top shelf. Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't fire that one. Well, I think it needs to be glazed, right? I mean, glaze fired. It's never been bisque. Right, 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 right. Yes, it has been through bisque. Oh, it has? It's all okay. blurring together, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to keep it straight. It's been so long since we've seen the inside of the studio. Just so everybody knows, so once we have the finished products, we will be doing a, a Facebook poll for you guys to vote on, which will be your favorite. That will probably go up sometime next week, maybe. Okay. I mean, so you just want a picture of them when they're sort of dried out a little? Yeah, and give right us, side up. Give give us the stats. Ooh. Okay. How much grief they caused us? Oh, you mean <laughs> measurements? <laughs> so this is. Yep. Still... It's only eight inches across the, the outside of the bowl. What? <laughs> My Holy bowl is eight inches across. <laughs> wow. That's a punch bowl for a party. Yeah, you know, I was saying he was making, making bird baths, <laughs> <but> not challenges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. Mitchell, I think you're right. <laughs> so we are down to the last 15 minutes. It is 1.45. Okay. We've been at this okay. for an hour and 45 minutes. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying, though, for not that long <laughs> How's that for a weird place to put it? <laughs> Just out of frame. <laughs> Just out of frame. Thank you, Sandra Jones. She says, this is so cool. Oh, Sandy, <laughs> yay. <laughs> well, if people like it, we'll probably try doing it again. Yeah, I think it's been quite fun.
what, what, what would the next challenge be? Yeah, what, what, what form? Well, you know, we all said we liked making goals. Yeah. Right. Maybe it, it, it could be a time competition. How many bowls oh. can you turn out in? <laughs> right. Yeah. Versus then how long we, could, we could do that and do um, dedicate all the bowls to empty bowls or something. Oh, that'd be nice. Yes. Well, that would be a good idea. It would be. For people who don't know what empty bowls is, it helps feed people. It's a program that helps feed people. Right. It's so. one of the fundraisers for the local food bank, right? Yes. It's been national. There's a, there's a yeah. People. And just to give a plug, Amanda, where did Empty Bowls start? Uh, Empty Bowls started in Detroit with our um, one of our former instructors, Christian Delamanure's high school teacher. Yep. Yeah. So were you guys doing empty bowls before Christian started teaching? Or did he bring it to 171? Lynn Wagner was very um, gung-ho about it. But I, I started taking classes when Christian was teaching. Before that, I wasn't taking classes. I was just practicing. So, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know the difference. It was there from the beginning of my time taking classes. Thanks. Nice. But Lynn was doing it with her church. Oh. Yeah, and Kirk, you've done and, it with Catholic Charities, uh, right? I've done, I've helped out Catholic Charities a little bit. I haven't made any bowls for them because they didn't, they don't have a way of firing cone six clay. Mm. We could fire cone 10 at Amira College. Amira College offered that opportunity. Um, but I did empty bowls when I was down in Wilmington. And the studio down there decided that, well, I guess it was the ceramics guild decided that they were going to do empty bowls and the, the local studios got involved. And so what we did for one of our classes is we did an empty bowl challenge and we challenged all the advanced students in the studio to make bowls and five of the students and one of the instructor all made empty bowls, and our challenge was 100 bowls for the empty bowls project. For how long? Oh, how much time? That took us about three months, two to three uh -huh. months. Uh -huh. So for that first empty bowl event, I think they raised $10,000. That's great. Yeah. So the way that, why don't you explain how the funds are raised? Oh, do you want to do it, Amanda, or should I? Sure. I will talk. Okay. About it. Um, so right. usually what ends up happening is artists and studios donate their time and materials to create these bowls. An organization then hosts an event, typically. Um, for us, it's the Food Bank of the Southern Tier and typically Corning Incorporated. People then purchase a ticket, and in return, they have kind of a modest meal, soup or salad, maybe a sandwich, typically in the bowls that have been made for the event, and then people go home with a bowl. And it's supposed to serve as a visual reminder that not everybody has food security in their lives, and the funds go towards whatever organization is partnered up with um, to, to help make that possible for the community that they serve. Right. So funds always stay local. Yes. Yep. Even though it's a, a nationally um, pursued program, every, every studio kind of has their own take on it. Um, some people do chili cook-offs they'll do soup strolls um other studios plan for one per year and they work towards it all year everybody kind of does kind of their own flavor of empty bowls and you pay much more money than a bowl of chili would cost 
But the yes. point is, is the feeding of people and you end up with a ceramic bowl. It's, it's a wonderful program. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, so I'm hoping that we can host our own sometime. I know you guys, the three of us yeah. have talked about it. Um, and maybe one of our friends of the studio might be able to help us have an ice cream social. Ooh, that would be nice. Oh. For an Empty Bowls event. A particular potter friend of the studio, yes. Yes. I'm all about ice cream. I, I, <laughs> I think we all that. are. <laughs> be, ice cream sundaes, ice cream Sunday bar. Yes. yes. That's perfect. Uh, I've wanted to have one called the Super Bowl, only it's S-O-U-P-E-R. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't give us ice there, cream. That is so true. There is a program through um, the churches that's called the Super Bowl every year. And what they do is they raise money on Super Bowl Sunday. And it's once again, it is S-U-P-E-R, Super Bowl. Yeah. And they raise, they raise money on Super Bowl Sunday for feeding the hungry. That's great. So. I know our local church does that. So. Really? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I need another bat. Oh, this is what I want to see when I'm trimming. Just perfect curly cues coming right off the edge. So that, that means Amanda has just the right dryness of her clay. Yeah. And yeah. a sharp tool. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, since we're talking about trimming. Do you two have your, what's your favorite company to get trim tools from? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. well, right now I'm using a Kemper tool. I'm using Kempers, yeah. Um, earlier I was using a Dolan tool that looks like this. It's that kind of right angle blade. It's kind of more of a um, Eastern tradition of trimming. Uh -huh. But the one that I'm using is that typical square ended loop that has a round loop at the other end of it. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of what I've become accustomed to. Yeah, I've got the, the flat ones like the Asian, and I got some campers. Martha, do you have a preference for trim tools? I have Kemper and Dolan, and my favorite is always the one that's sharpest. <laughs> yes. And that's because if you're watching and you're wondering what the, what the trimming is, it's when the clay is close to leather hard or leather hard, you need to be able to like dig into the clay, but not dig into the clay. You want it not to float on top. You want it to cut, but not cut too much. So yeah, it's, it's, we're kind of like shaving the clay. Yes. Perfect. That's a perfect. So did you guys decide why we're calling this the quarantine cup? Um, I think that was more a unilateral decision on my part. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk about at the beginning um, how this whole thing came about with you did. Alan, okay. Alan and Jeff instigating yeah. us on a text message. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll mention again, if any of our clay friends out there have been making their own goblet at home, email me a picture of it and we can put it in for the running to be voted as a contender for being dubbed the quarantine cup. Mm -hmm. All right, we are at the, we are about five minutes to two o'clock, so... I guess if we have any last statements we want to make before we go out, then this is the time to do it. Well, I would um, like to make sure that everybody knows that we do have classes that we're going mm -hmm. to be doing online through Zoom and that we are very interested to have people participate in those and be involved because... If people can't tell from this, 
the three of us definitely like to play in the clay. <laughs> and the we think that everybody should have some time in the clay. Uh, My mom at least likes like, at least it, it likes to watch these. My mom and dad have been our audience for each of our live streams. That's wonderful. <laughs> I haven't I told my parents. <laughs> I want you to know that one of my good friends, sister-in-law, I met her at a wedding reception, and it, all things coming together, she's been watching some of these because she's somebody that's new to Clay. That she doesn't live anywhere near here, but, mm -hmm. but it's something she can do from home and do as much as anybody can do from home, right? So especially yeah. hand building. Yep. So I, I would I would add that this is maybe the upside of us being remote on location is that we can broaden our student base. So you don't have to be familiar with 171 to sign up for one of our classes. We would love mm -hmm. to to have our our friends come back and and take classes with us, of course. But this gives us a chance to reach some new friends. Mm -hmm. And if you find that this is something if, that is not interesting for participating in this, do go. When you have the opportunity, go find a local studio. Get your hands in the mud. It's this is one of those things that um, it's not always the easiest when you start out, but it is definitely worth trying. So. I agree. Yeah. yeah, failure is always an option, as Kirk mentioned earlier in the beginning. <laughs> um, and the wonderful thing about clay at this state is it is 100% recyclable. So yep. this is that's right. This is it teaches you a lot of uh, humility, I think. Oh my, <laughs> yeah. And um, just when you start to think you have everything under under your belt and sure of something clay sets you back <laughs> and that isn't to dissuade anybody from trying it but just to reiterate that even though each of us have been doing this for several years we are still learning and practicing ourselves there's always a way to get better at something so even though it seems a little bit frustrating and it doesn't work out immediately practice 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 will get you there and we would love to be able to help you get there yourself. And there's nothing more gratifying than when you get up in the morning and you're groggy and you make yourself your first cup of coffee or hot cocoa or a cup of tea and you pour it in a mug that you have made mm -hmm. and sit there and drink a you know, wonderful cup of coffee, cup of tea, looking at you know, something that you made and enjoying your work that is... That is one of the, the things that I appreciate most about this process. So, so good job, team. Keep going. <laughs> we'll see if I can get one that's not going to crack apart. <laughs> um, and all of our friends watching, make sure to keep an eye on 171's Facebook page for, t for your chance to vote for who can be the quarantine cup champion champion yeah. yeah so yeah everybody out there thank you for joining us thanks this, thank you very much i hope you had as much it's fun it's been a good day um, <laughs> and thank you yeah. mitchell thank you i'm glad yes, we were able to you. get you on here, mitchell. <laughs> me too me too <laughs> so i'm gonna have you guys hang on for a minute at, um while I the broadcast, um, but okay. again, thanks to everybody who joined us. Um, check out our website. Um, you can go mm -hmm. to 171 Cedar Art Center somewhere. I have that um, cedararts.org, um, and actually, if just click on, I think the first thing that comes up, or maybe the second thing that comes up, is our new online class listings. So just click on that and see what we have going on. So. Again, thank you all for joining us and have enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Yeah, stay safe. Bye.
Miss Bye. you all. <laughs>